What's up guys, Mason the Brock Henderson here, and this is Inhuman Season 1, Episode 7 and 8, the final two episodes of the season, Havoc in the Hidden Land, and finally Black Bolt. So I apologize if I may be a little out of this, it is very late, and I'm having to do this review, so I'm going to try to stay awake and get through this as quick as possible, but these are the final two episodes of what is a fairly interesting first season, and the thing about it is, you know, once again, IMDB ratings, it's the only ratings I really look at, but I find it shocking that a show that is fairly interesting, had some good funny moments, had some good action moments as well, a show interesting enough, and it's getting ratings like, let's see, 6.4, and then 6.5, 6.6, 6.6, three 6.8s, and then a 6.9 for the finale. I mean... Pretty low ratings for this. I'd rate it 7.5. You know, it's it's average. It's not, you know, 8.0. It's not 9. But it's, you know, 7, 7, somewhere in there. You know, 7-ish. And so the fact to see it rated so low is just kind of like... It sort of shows that everybody's, I guess, expectations of Marvel shows are that much higher. And so if it's just an average show, it tends to be rated pretty low. You know, you look at Inhumans... You look at Iron Fist, everybody's expecting so much now out of Marvel because everything they've been putting out has been solid, 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 solid. And so you got a couple shows that are kind of eh, and they're just, ratings are low. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really kind of sad because this is a show that I think has done a very good job so far this season of sort of building up a new set of characters, a new cast of characters. They're probably going to tie in somehow with the overall universe and maybe even with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., because Inhumans have been kind of a big deal on that show. So, anyway, let's talk about the story for these two. First of all, we've got, I guess, the, the main story, which is Maximus and his plan, why he decided to overthrow Black Bolt and take over Adelan, um, finally coming to a head. You know, we see him, he wants to go through Terra Genesis again, and that's why he had Declan review all of these Inhumans and their powers, because he wants to find out if he can possibly go through Terra Genesis to, to, again to give himself more power, or to give himself powers, uh, based off of the blood and the DNA testing of these other Inhumans. So that's sort of his plan all along, is just to put himself in a position where the Genetic Council can't question him, Black Bolt's out of the picture, so he's not going to interfere in any way. And so that's been pretty much the only reason why he became king in the first place, which once again goes to show that even though what he was saying was very, was right. You know, like I said, the protagonists of the show were kind of wrong in how they were handling their own kingdom. You know, the way they were ruling was not right. Most of what Maximus was saying was right. You know, he was correct in that they were wrong in how they treated the lower people that weren't in humans or were not as higher ranked in humans. Um, so it's funny to see that everything he was saying was right, but ultimately he's still the bad guy because his intentions are not matching up with his words. Kind of predictable, you know, kind of, I've seen this before, I've seen people, uh, I've seen bad guys who say all the right things, but in the end they're just bad guys because of their intentions. It's nothing I haven't seen before, but to see it sort of play out this way, it's kind of like showing in the end he was wrong all along. Um, but so we, we see him get Declan to the moon, uh, there's a scene where they set up a parlay uh, between Black Bolt and Maximus. Ultimately, Maximus just kind of betrays them in the middle of that. Uh, yeah, just sort of out of nowhere. He just, oh yeah, okay, so we'll go through, I'll go through the second Terra Genesis again. You guys can have the crown, or the throne back. Um, I'll just need Dr. Declan's help to do it. They go get Dr. Declan from Black Bolt's group. And he's like, no, you have no bargaining chips, so I decline, see ya. And I'm just like, wait a minute, so he says you have to honor this parlay by no fighting, no action, but then completely betrays the parlay by agreeing, but then disagreeing. You know, he, he agrees to it, but then he rejects it. I'm like, at that point, if you punch him in the face or if you fight him, well, he's already betrayed the, the parlay by lying to you, by going back on his word. So at that point, I'd say, hey, fair game then. You know, if you're going to lie to us, if you're going to betray the thought of a parlay by agreeing to something, then rejecting it right after, after you've taken what we gave you. You know, like if you went to a, 
people paying paying for guns or something like that. Some guy gives the the guy who owns the guns. He gives him the money. He's like, "All right, here now, give me my guns." And the guy's like, "Well, now you have nothing to offer, so see ya." That that wouldn't work. The guy would be like, "Um, screw you," and shoot him or something. So in this case, it just kind of feels like, why didn't they do anything about it? They just sort of like, oh, okay, well, I guess you're right, and then left. I mean, they did have a plan in place afterwards, but it just kind of felt like a wasted scene. And to be honest, I will say, while I did enjoy most of these final two episodes, I will say a lot of the last episode did get a little bit jumbled, um, mainly because there was a lot of jumping back and forth, you know, we cut to this parlay, and then all of a sudden we're back in the bunker, and they're talking about what to do next. And then we cut, they're going, I forget where they went to next, but they're like going to do this one thing inside the palace, and then they come back to the bunker. And then they find out, okay, well, we need to get to the control room, and then they're back in the bunker. And then they're like, all right, Benusa, we need you to go to the control room so we can speak on the thing. And then they're back to the bunker. And it just felt like they kept going back and forth and back and forth, and it felt like this concept of time where it's like, okay, Every hour he has to scan his palm, and if he doesn't, then the barrier is going to fail. It felt like all of that just kind of went, eh, time doesn't really mean anything here. You know, it's been probably like an hour to get to the bunker and back, but we're, we're really not going to emphasize this concept of time. I don't know, it just it sort of felt, felt like it was jumping a little bit. Uh, it felt like it was just sort of out of order at times, but anyway... So we, we see, after this whole parlay, we see them, apparently Black Bolt had this whole plan in place. Uh, Triton is still alive, which I kind of figured because he got shot and then fell into water and he seemed like he was, you know, a, uh, an inhuman that would be in the water a lot, especially with a name like Triton. But we find out he's still alive and apparently he's going to take care of some imposter. Um never actually see that you know it's one of those things where a lot of this stuff I'm hoping it will get explained maybe next season but yeah there are certain scenes that happened that didn't really lead to anything and this was one of them he's Black Bolt sends Triton out and then they're like where's he going and then Medusa says to deal with the imposter and then we don't see him again until he is taking out Maximus's guard and then capturing him so what imposter <laughs> you know was he talking about Maximus is like the imposter of a king or something. I don't know. It's just kind of weird. Uh, but Triton, pretty cool. You know, just watching him do his work, kill people. A lot of the fighting scenes with him were pretty awesome. Uh, he's very agile and very good fighter with the swords. We also see Karnak is apparently trying to get Gorgon back to life uh, by putting him through a second Terragenesis with the, the DNA of Auron, who has the ability to heal. And so we see a pretty cool scene with him where he goes into the control room and Auron's there with some guards. He takes out everybody, but then this one guy comes up behind him and shoots. And so then we get to see his power in action again. Uh, and the fight scene itself was pretty cool. There's this really cool shot that they did where it's like the room moved while he was doing a, he was doing a flip. But it was like he stayed still and the room around him moved as he flipped towards the guy to kick him. Pretty cool shots like that, and a lot of the action scenes in these two episodes were really good. But seeing Orin's power, or not Orin, Karnak's power in action again, I love it. You know, I hope to see a lot more of it because I just love watching him in action, watching him figure out the little things like, alright, so, shot came from here, this angle, you know, okay, let's study the gun a little bit. And then he comes back to it, does the same thing, except this time, instead of getting shot in the back, he does a little flip kick and then kicks the... I don't even know what they're shooting out of the guns, but he kicks it back at the guy and knocks him out. I'm like, that was freaking awesome. But ultimately, he convinces Orin because she's having her doubts about Maximus now. Uh, convinces her to help get Gorgon back to life. And so they take his body to the Terragenesis thing. Uh, he injects her blood into him, and nothing happens at first. But, of course, with all the focus that they're putting on this and the focus on, oh no, it didn't work. Of course, it's going to work later. Uh, we see Maximus brings Dr. Declan to the Terragenesis chambers and shows him everything. But then as he's showing it to him, Gorgon, they see his body in there. And then all of a sudden, the barrier starts failing. And so everything's starting to bust up around him. He's like, all right, you stay here. I'm going to go over there. And then Gorgon wakes up. And he's in... 
the best way I can describe it is like, uh, obviously this is weird talking about a Marvel show, but it's almost like whenever people would come out of the Lazar- Lazarus Pit and, you know, Batman or even the show Arrow, you know, whenever they came out of the Lazarus Pit, it was like they were kind of giving away a part of their soul. And so when they came back, they weren't fully themselves. They were, they were something darker. That's kind of what this felt like. When he wakes up, he's almost animalistic, and he just starts attacking everything. He's throwing boxes. He's throwing the Terror Genesis chambers. And then finally, Dr. Declan is, like, standing up. He's like, hey, okay, just calm down. You know, I will hurt you if I have to. I don't want to. And, of course, Gorgon, big bulking guy, is just like, can't hurt me. He knocks the thing, the wooden plank out of the way and then throws him into a terror genesis chamber and then kills him. Um, so, yeah, Declan's dead. <laughs> um, kind of feels like a little bit of a waste of a character. It feels like he was there just to give Maximus hope and then it didn't really lead anywhere. Um, then we see Karnak gets put into the, the chamber that uh, Black Bolt was in for most... You know, whenever he needed his quiet time to just be alone. Uh, he gets put in there almost like a prison, and they throw Gorgon in there. He manages to get through to Gorgon a little bit, but he's still struggling with those animalistic side of him. And so he just starts, like, kicking the wall, kicking, and then finally brute force just knocks it out because it was built for Sonic, or to withstand Sonic ways, but not necessarily physical uh, strength. So a little bit of a loophole, but I'll accept it. So then... You know, they're, they've broken out. There's a lot of, what, you resurrected them? You, how dare you do this? How dare you do that? And you know, every, every single time somebody sees that Gorgon is resurrected, they're freaking out. Like, that's unacceptable. Um, we see Maximus talk to uh, Bernaja and ask him, you know, where are the Terra Genesis crystals? He's like, I don't know. That's not how my power works. He said, well, what's in my future? Touches him, and he says, you will be the undisputed king of Adelan. And this is where I kind of just went, I think we all know what this means. It means he's going to be alone on Adelan as it gets destroyed because at this point it already kind of felt like they were setting up that Adelan was going to be no more and most likely all the Inhumans would end up down on Earth. Um, so kind of uh, it's a little bit frustrating that they sort of foreshadowed it that obviously. You know, It could have been a little bit more vague and a little bit less obvious for us to figure out but you know, it's it's a little thing, but it is kind of frustrating whenever they think they need to foreshadow something like that. Um, it's almost like they think they're being clever when they're not being that clever. Uh, so Maximus, of course, is kind of going through his... almost like a temper tantrum for these last two episodes. Uh, you can see how frustrated he is that Black Bolt and, and all of the royal family are back, and they're threatening him, and... Even though he's kind of in control because he, you know, if you kill me, the failsafe is gone, the barrier will fall. Even though he has all that in place, you can still see that he's still a little bit worried. You know, he still has that kind of frustration of things are not going as smoothly as he wanted them to. The whole Terra Genesis thing is not working out for him, and so he's getting upset. So, yeah, kind of interesting to see the main villain for this season is kind of... Wimp- wimping out a little bit here. Um, but, you know, ultimately what it leads to is we see he's willing to let Adelan die because he's not getting what he wants. And so if he can't have Adelan, nobody can. So, of course, this leads to the royal family convincing everybody to evacuate, um, just talking to everybody. And I-, I wondered if they were going to do kind of this thing where everybody sees them and they're just like, oh, we can't trust you. You abused us for so long. But thankfully they didn't do that because, well, frankly, at the time, the barrier started failing right after Medusa gave the speech. And so everybody's just kind of like, oh, yeah, we're going to die. We should probably leave now. So, of course, everybody starts to leave through the the wall guy, Eldrak. I kind of felt like, I'm kind of wondering if anything's going to happen with Eldrak in the future. Because it kind of felt like he should be a bit more of an important character when we saw him at first. Uh, but he just sort of got thrown to the side and then brought back up in this last episode as an evacuation policy. Um, but anyway, so ultimately all this is going on. We get to the final moment where everybody's been evacuated, all the families together, and you can see that Black Bolt doesn't want to go because he wants to help Maximus. He wants to save his brother. And it does make sense. You know, it's 
it's part there's part of me in this moment that I was like seriously you know he's been just this annoying little prick to this entire season he's tried to kill you several times he did kill Gorgon at one point I do you really want to go help him like do you have to well the the thought of family is pretty powerful um, so it does make sense that Black Bolt ultimately would say you know what despite all of that he's still my brother I still need to go save his life. I still need to go help him because of that. Uh, so we do see him talking to Medusa about it. Medusa, of course, is like, no, look at what he's done to me. He doesn't deserve this. Black Bolt is like, eh, I, I need to help him. You know, it's family. So, you know, they have this kind of final, like, this might be a goodbye moment, but of course you know it's not going to be because, well, <laughs> frankly, Black Bolt is kind of the main character in all of this. He's not, obviously he's one of the main characters, but he's sort of the one that, gets a lot of the focus and it's kind of interesting because he can't even talk uh but yeah so everybody leaves except for black bolt and the maximus is still there as well so he goes to talk to him they have a little bit of a, a conversation maximus reveals that apparently it was his fault that black bolt got upset and then spoke and killed their parents um because he forged this document that um I guess got Black Bolt upset and that's why he spoke to kill the parents. I don't know. It wasn't... I'm still not entirely sure why he spoke in the first place, to be honest. This whole story has kind of just been vague for this season. You know, there's that one scene that I talked about earlier where we saw Maximus having this dream and at one point Medusa says, you're the one who killed your parents. And I kind of wondered maybe he did something that Black Bolt didn't see that killed the parents or something. But ultimately what we find out is that he forged the document that got Black Bolt mad enough to kill the parents. And that's still kind of like, it's still Black Bolt's fault. Yes, he was spurred on by Maximus lying to him, but still it's, you know, he's, he's the one that still spoke. He's the one that still killed his own parents. So it doesn't change a whole lot other than Maximus was involved and that just makes him even more despicable, but... I don't know. It's just kind of random thrown uh, thing thrown in there at the end, but ultimately, you know, we see this almost kind of funny moment where Maximus is just like, "Go on, kill me," and then you see Black Bolt like breathe in and then just punch him and knock him out. It's kind of funny, and then he gets thrown in the bunker because the bunker apparently will survive even if all of Adelan falls and the barrier fails. Um, and so, of course, you know, like I said, Adelan is gone. And that makes Maximus technically the undisputed king of the area, Adelan. But they do kind of the whole Thor Ragnarok thing. Spoilers if you don't know. Um, they, they do the whole thing at the end of Thor Ragnarok where they're talking about, you know... Um, uh, what is it? What is the name of the place? God, I'm so tired I can't remember. Uh, Thor's World. What is it called? I can't remember the name of it now. Wow. I am that tired. I cannot even remember. Asgard. Asgard. Yes. <laughs> wow. Okay, so, yes. Thor, at the end of Thor Ragnarok, they're talking about how Asgard is not just a place. It's a group of people. They do the same thing here, where they're like, you know, Adelaide is not just this place. It is everybody. It's the people here. I don't know if that was intentional or if... Maybe the writing team sort of talked and got the ideas from each other. Uh, but yeah, so they officially are now down on Earth and they're like, this is our new home. So, you know, that's pretty much how this whole thing ends. There is a little bit of setup for next season, though, because throughout these two episodes, sprinkled in are these little hints of a more dangerous enemy coming. I'm not really sure what's, what this is supposed to be. Um, I'll be interested to see if maybe it has something to do with the, the teleporting rock that we saw. In fact, now that I think about it, Eldrak is pretty similar in, as far as property is concerned to that teleporting rock that we saw in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you know, the one that teleported uh, Simmons to the, the other side of the world. So, yeah, I'll be kind of interested to see if that has anything to do with it. You know, it talked about it being the harbinger of death for Inhumans, and obviously we saw it was because it the most powerful inhuman uh, hive was sent through this uh, wormhole of sorts. 
But yeah, I don't know. I, I'll be very curious to see if it's tied into anything we've already seen in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., if it's going to be an entirely new bad guy from somewhere. Um, but, I mean, that's that's pretty much it for this first season. And like I said, it, it's not great. Uh, frankly, I didn't exactly expect it to be fantastic. You know, From what I saw from the previews, I didn't expect it to be much. You know, the acting was kind of bland in the previews. It didn't seem like it was going to be that great. But as the season got along, I will say it grew on me. You know, it's kind of similar to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in that respect, in that the first season wasn't great. But by the end of it, I'm kind of like, you know what? Okay, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what they're going to do next. Uh, I will say Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. definitely did grip me a lot more by the end of the first season, for obvious reasons, because of the whole Hydra thing being inside S.H.I.E.L.D. and tying in with the movies. Uh, this one didn't really have that gripping moment that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. did in the first season. But the characters are interesting enough. The only one, like I said, that really didn't grip me overall was Crystal. And that's just because, I don't know, she, her acting wasn't that great. And on top of that, she kind of just felt like we need some hot chick to be in here. Um, and that's that felt like it was her only purpose. You know, Obviously, she's the one that's close with Lockjaw, so... You got a teleporting dog, you have to have the, the dog's owner. She was the dog's owner. But aside from that, she didn't really serve much of a purpose. Her character growth consisted of her finding this random hot guy and then falling for him. And then, like, pretty much a, a quick romance and then all of a sudden she was, like, desperate to see him again or something. I don't know. It just felt like her character was probably the weakest out of all of the main characters. As far as the rest of them, though, you know, I really enjoyed Karnak and uh, Gorgon they're a little back and forth for most of the season. I think Medusa definitely grew from like this kind of strange woman with this hair that she could control. Uh, she had to pretty much work with this human that she couldn't really get along with and that she pretty much looked down upon for most of the season. And by the end of it, they kind of became friends and she had to work through that. Uh, Black Bolt, for not being able to speak, was a fairly interesting character. He did a very good job of getting most of his emotions through without having to speak. Um, the The whole form of communication, the sign language stuff, that was a lot of fun to see for most of the season. Uh, the fact that if he does speak, it's pretty much like a, a Dragonborn shell. I mean, that's very interesting in and of itself. And then on top of that, you look at Maximus as the villain for this season. Not the strongest villain, but I think he's almost kind of a precursor of what's to come. You know, this is just like, you have to have something to put your heroes into peril for the first season. And this is what it was. You know, it was the brother of Black Bolt just starting a revolution against them. And that's all it was. I will say I was a little bit disappointed that they didn't go a little bit further with Maximus and maybe give him the powers of an inhuman. But the fact that he's still alive on the moon means that they can still go that route. Uh, because it's something that he wants to do. He wants to get powers. He wants to receive inhuman powers. And I feel like because he's been... I think they said he already got injected with the DNA. All he needed was the Terrigenesis to happen to him. Um, I'll be curious to see if maybe one of the ter Terrigen crystals got left in the bunker. Possibly like it dropped out. And maybe he'll find it. He'll put it on the ground and then get turned into some sort of ultra-powerful inhuman or something. I don't know. I, I'm really speculating at this point. I don't know what their plan is within humans. I don't know why they're introducing it now. What's their plan going forward? Um, hopefully it doesn't turn into another Agent Carter where they get a couple good seasons in. It's just like, oh, this is finally getting interesting. And then it gets cut off because the ratings and the views aren't that high. Um, but, you know, it's something to look forward to. I hope that they can pick up where they left off this first season and get better from here. Because it really can get better, and it should get better. If it wants to be remembered as something, it needs to improve for sure. Uh, but, you know, for the first season, not bad. It was it was average. So that's about all I can say at this point. You know, if I forgot anything, just let me know. We can talk about it and discuss all that good stuff. Leave a like and subscribe for future Inhumans reviews. I'll see you guys next season. Peace out.